everybody welcome back to the channel uh, first of all I'd like to wish everybody a happy new year I hope everybody had a good ending to 2022 and so far ha has off to a good start to 2023 uh, so I hope uh, I hope this year will be blessed for a lot of you uh, with that in mind I uh, wanted to do a 2023 resolutions and goals hobby goals and uh, I didn't want to simply just read from a list and chuck them off. So I'm going to kind of walk around and discuss uh, the goals I have. Uh, we may make it back to my game table uh, as I might work on a few projects if I talk about them a little more in detail. Now, I, I have quite a few goals. I, I, I wrote them down uh, a few days before the year ended. So not sure if I'm going to get to all of them or some of them I might just read off. You know, I might not have much discussion. But let's start with our first goal. So my first hobby goal this year is going to be to play more games. And by that, I, I simply want to at least try to play one game a week. Uh, which is not a lot, obviously, but it's be, it would be far more than I was able to manage this year. Uh, a lot of times when you, you get through your day and you're tired... Uh, and you've just been sitting around and watching TV or you've just gotten back in the house from driving around You really don't want to set up a game You don't want to you know try to play it or anything and so you you might paint because sometimes that's relaxing or On the other hand you might just surf the web which kind of what I wind up ending up doing But this year I want to break out of that and get myself in the point of at least playing one game a week even if I don't finish the game, the object will be to take the game out the box, to set the game up, and maybe do a few turns so I can discuss it, I can feel more comfortable with it if I do decide to play a whole game, and that will count. I will count that as one game a week. And so really, you figure I only have to do that, what, 50, 52 times in a year? So we are going to see if we are, uh, if we are able to make that happen. For example, a game like this, Alien Faded in the Stromo, I picked that up, uh, I got picked this up after Christmas. I think it was like $14. It normally was $29. But this is actually a very quick game to play from what I've seen. But I've never actually set it up. So this would actually be a perfect game like for the first week to kind of pull out and play. Uh, this game, Tide of Iron, I would love to get that back out. I used to play this a lot back in Michigan uh, some years back uh, when I had a, a, a guy I knew uh, in the area who played games with me. Uh, unfortunately, I think I started winning too many games and then he didn't want to play anymore. He, he was the type of person that uh, if we bought a new game, he would play it. As long as he was winning, he always wanted to play it. If I won, he would play me one or two more times. And if I kept winning after that, he didn't want to play. And then he would switch games. And so he was doing that uh, repeatedly. You know, and eventually, you know, it kind of wore thin. And, you know, we stopped playing together. Uh, Gears of War, this is another game I'd like to get out this year. And at least run a few turns. So that just gives you an idea of my thinking uh, for my my uh, goal number one which is to play more games and to play at least one game a week my second goal is to paint at least 50 percent of my miniatures this year using my airbrush now this is my compressor i've got one of my brushes down here if i can get it out and as you can see it's pristine because <laughs> it has not been used very much and so that's one of my goals I think that would actually help me with a lot of goals if I'm able to uh, just kind of incorporate this into my painting I'm so used to just painting with my brushes and stuff that uh, it just it just kind of feels not unnatural when I have to set this up and load it and load the paints and stuff and I'm thinking man just grab your brush and get started but I really want to force myself because I know there's a lot of people I watch on YouTube and they will tell you, oh yeah, well, I did all this with my airbrush or I'm going to grab my airbrush, especially modelers, which is funny because I do a lot of modeling. And uh, I think if I just, I think I, I, I have used this and I, I'm 
fairly I'm fairly comfortable with how to use it and how it works. I mean, I even have a vehicle that I airbrushed uh, when I fit when when I did the camo scheme. So I did this using the airbrush. These different splashes in order to put the camel scheme on here right and I think it came out okay I mean the vehicle itself has some limitations but I, I don't think that had nothing to do with my airbrushing so that is one of my goals this year is to really paint 50 percent or more of my miniatures going forward with the airbrush now that may not include figures but even if I just prime some of them with the airbrush, because as it gets colder here, it's going to be a lot harder to use my rattle cans to do priming. So I think I think that is a goal that, you know, if I get started on it early in the year, it will it will make a big difference. All right. So goal number three is to get rid of or sell off at least 1000 miniature figures. And so what you're looking at now, this is a tray of painted figures that I currently have listed on my eBay channel. Uh, they, they're going to be auctioned. I'm, I'm not auctioning the whole tray. I've, bought, I've broke it up into several smaller auctions. So I think there's like 10 of these in each auction. Uh, but you can get my eBay store information uh, at the end of this video if you're interested. If you see something in here you might want to bid on because I think most of the auctions are starting at like ten dollars for ten figures that they're all painted uh, but that is part of my goal is to at least get rid of you know a thousand of my miniatures and I mean it's not really uh, basically there isn't anything wrong with these miniatures so I mean I'm not I'm not doing this because there's something wrong with these I just I just have too many miniatures Right, I, I think I have thousands of miniatures, and I hate to say it, but um, you know, if I show you these here, all of these canisters contain miniatures. Every one of them are just foam pads and foam pads and foam pads full of miniatures. And uh, these are just the ones that are painted. They don't include any that are unpainted or pre-painted these are more miniatures in there uh, there's a few more cases here there's some buckets there and so I think it was 2020 or maybe it was 2021 I was really getting rid of a lot of miniatures I think in 2020 I think I did get rid of about a thousand miniatures because at one point I had a system where if I bought for every one miniature I bought I got rid of three and I stuck to that uh, uh, studiously or fastidiously up until probably the end of that year. And uh, I think by then I had probably gotten rid of about a thousand miniatures, which did not make a dent in my collection. Even if I get rid of a thousand now, you know, it's not going to make a big dent. I mean, to give you an example, I would say each of these buckets probably has 10, I'd say about 40 miniatures in it so if you figure you know that's maybe roughly a hundred maybe another 200 300 400 500 600 7 so you could see uh, getting rid of a thousand miniatures would be like one of those rows uh, these buckets here these probably have at least a hundred miniatures in each each one of these if not more maybe 10 20 30 40 50 6 yeah they might have about 300 miniatures in each one of those uh so that is that is my goal is i'm gonna keep knocking away at it it's getting harder you know as you pull out miniatures and sell them the next time you go back to pull out more you know it's harder to find the ones you want to get rid of because obviously you skipped over them last time because you liked them and so it starts to get to the point where you're not getting rid of your worst painted miniatures or your worst sculpted miniatures. You're just getting rid of miniatures you less like, you like less than others. So, but I, I would like to to get this down. I mean, at some point, you know, I would like maybe just to have two rows of whatever, just two rows, either of all of those boxes or two rows of all of these boxes. Because, you know, you still want to buy stuff, too. 
So that is my goal number. What is that? Three. So for my goal number four is to paint six of my board games. And, you know, at one time I had actually painted up just about all of the miniatures I had that were, you know, blisters or individual figures. And I had decided, well, you know, I might as well start on my board games now. Because prior to that, I really never painted board games. That just wasn't a, it wasn't a thing that I did. I, you know, I played them and I put the pieces back. Like when I played Tide of Iron all those years, I never bothered to paint them. Uh, it's just, you know, I just, I just didn't need them painted. They were only board games. But now, you know, that's kind of the thing. As soon as people buy a board game, they start talking about how they're going to get it painted. So I would like to paint mine. I mean, that's not to me. It's not as big a goal as uh, painting my own miniatures, or at least my individual miniatures. But you know, every year if I can get five or six more board games painted, I think that would be cool. Because eventually, I'd have most of my board game collection painted. I do not buy a lot of pure board games in a year, unlike miniatures and models. I think in any given year, I may buy ten board games and that's that's one board game a month and that may be high meaning it may be even less than that uh typically it's something uh obviously that has miniatures in it obviously that is uh a lot of times it's retail because i don't like paying shipping on board games so if i paint six miniatures in a year that's almost half of whatever I brought in that year. Plus, I'm always selling board games. Unlike my miniatures, uh, I am not as reluctant to get rid of board games. But one of the games I'd like to get painted is this Star Wars Legion. Because I would actually like to play some games. Of that. I mean, this is basically a miniature game in a box. So I'd like to get that painted. This is actually painted, this AVP. This Baratheon faction needs to be painted. This Free Folk box is all painted. This I'm probably going to sell. This one has no miniatures in it. Although I think you can buy some little ships or something. But the stuff that comes in there I would not bother painting. The Star Saga. That one is actually for sale. But I may wind up having to paint it. Just because it, it hasn't sold. And um. Uh, you know, I might just keep it and then paint it and have a painted copy and then another copy. These others down here, Mage Knight, I'm not going to paint that. That one is like the Star Trek uh, Mage Knight game. Age of Conan, I've got that listed for sale. The Stark vs. Lannister box down here, that is all painted. Uh, now, these are not. This Hero Quest has to be painted. Shadow War Armageddon, that is not complete. But whatever's in there, I may paint. Core Space, I got this for Christmas in an exchange. So I'd like to paint that. This is not complete. One of the factions is missing. So, and I, I am, I'm not real big on painting Infinity Miniatures. So actually, I have this listed for sale. These are War Games. That has no miniatures. This is the other Star Saga, which is why I have that one listed. Because this is the Kickstarter version that was shipped. The other one in the white box is the retail. So this is the one I really will paint. The other one I may or may not paint. Siege of the Citadel. This is listed for sale. This is open, but it's never been played. And I don't I don't plan on keeping it. I kind of got, got it on a whim. I got a good price on it, and so I bought it. I do like this game. And so I may set it up and play it because nobody seems like they're interested in, in, in buying it off of me. Uh, so I may set this up and play it, but I don't think I'm going to paint the miniatures. I actually have some expansions that I broke the miniatures out of. And I may paint those uh, just because I have them. This Judge Dread game, I recently got this up. Actually, I got two. So I got one of these up for sale as well on my eBay page, but I will probably paint my copy. These are all like war games with chits and counters. No painting required. I think there's some miniatures in here. Like I've heard the game is not that great, but I got this at Target, so 
I may paint those. I don't know what scale the miniature. Definitely got to paint my Halo games. Definitely. This was one of my grails that I was able to locate this year. So I definitely want to get that painted. Uh, Chicago Way. I actually want to do a few gangster miniature games next year. So there are some miniatures in here that need to be painted. Delta One. There's actually, you get some miniatures in here. This is like a special ops tabletop game. So I'd want to paint that. So you guys kind of get the, uh, should get the impression. You know, I've got at least six right here in front of me without even going back into my uh, closet. So that brings us to number six. And my number six New Year's resolution is to set up a permanent game table. And this was the beginning of that, right? Because at one point, this table right here, this desk, goes from there to there. This desk was actually over here. And so I, I wound up clearing out some stuff, pushing that desk against the wall. And the object was to use this table as a dedicated uh, gaming table. So I would always have a game set up on this table. Maybe a board game or two board games running simultaneously or just one miniatures game. And like playing solo, this is like the perfect size for me. It's, it's, it's longer than it is wide. So I think it's four foot long and two and a half feet wide, which is a little, little narrow. I, I prefer it was three feet. But I also have another table that is, I think, three and a half by three and a half. Uh... I think that one is outside. At least I used to have. I hope I didn't get rid of that table. But uh, what I would like to do is just leave this dedicated space in my room and always have a game on it. And that is going to help me with my first goal to play one game a week. Because basically I could set the game up on Monday, kind of spend Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday reading the rules, getting familiar with it. And then Friday, I could run a game. You know, Saturday, I can, you know, either run another game of it and take it down Sunday. And then Monday, we put the next game up or we slide it over. And so that is just my goal is to have a permanent, dedicated gaming table. I mean, unlike uh, in some of my older homes and homes I've seen other people with, I don't have a basement. You know, I live in an apartment. So I don't really have a basement where I can just have a game table all the time with uh, stuff on it. But I think I could just have a dedicated table, right? Even if it's not like a game room is what I meant to say. Uh, I don't have a dedicated game room because this is my bedroom as well as my, my room with my stuff. But I can at least try to get a dedicated gaming table. And so really what I need to do is I need to get all of this stuff cleared off of here because it seems like no matter whenever I have table space, painted and unpainted miniatures wind up on there, which is the same thing that has happened with this one. And so this I want, this will be my permanent kind of miniature staging area. And then the other table over there uh, will hopefully become a permanent game table. I mean, that's kind of a resolution I could knock out, you know, tomorrow morning if I if I get up enough energy, you know, that I can get some of this move. Some of this was out because I I wanted to do a video on it, and so I didn't want to put it all away. Uh, Cause for example, this was a lot of painting and things that I've gotten done recently. Some other stuff I haven't shown you guys on the channel. Like example, I picked this up the other day. I wasn't even aware about this. It's kind of a toy line. And this is an Alien vs. Predator APC. And it's not bad. I mean, even the scale is almost identical to the scale that companies like Eagle Moss and them were doing. And I mean, they were selling things like that for, you know, $200. Now, I'm not exaggerating. To get to kind of get a resin one or something, or cinematics, you, you see how much there is charged. This is a toy you can pick up for 20 bucks. And I was going to do a video and uh, show you guys uh, the company that makes that, because I, I can't remember the name right now. I don't know if it's on the bottom. Uh, I 
Can you guys see any of that? Because if you can make that out, you can pick this thing up still. Matter of fact, I was at a comic book store the other day, and they had one. So let me see if I can read it for you. So it says, Lanark, 20th Century Fox, L-A-N-A-R-D. Look that up if you're looking to get one of those, because that is not a bad scale. The rest of that is stuff I just painted that I was going to show you guys. And I don't know. I mean, now with the year has started, I might, I might just put it up. This was actually a second batch of 100 miniatures that I had got through. And I think this was like another 50 that I finished before... I kind of switched everything up to get ready for the new year. But yeah, number six is to come up with and to create a dedicated gaming table. Just pure table. Nothing's going to go on that table other than a game or a miniature game in progress. So my number seven um, miniature goal is going to take us to another room in my home, kind of my library. And that goal is to read 10 wargaming books this year. I love collecting wargaming books. Matter of fact, that is that is my first passion. Uh, when I was younger and growing up in the city, I could not uh, get war games, quote unquote. First of all, I couldn't afford them. And secondly, they did not sell them uh, in anywhere in my neighborhood. And there was, there was no internet when I was growing up, believe it or not. Uh, no internet when I was growing up so I think I, I, I actually remember when the whole word internet came about uh, it was through a company called AOL.com but I still love collecting just war games books and the older they are the better the better they are to me and the more I love them so you've got this here a guide to war game I think this is by George Cush this is Barry Carter Naval War Games this is a more recent Arthur. This is Daniel Mercy. So he did a War Gamers Guide 1066 in the Norman Conquest. Now Daniel Mercy has done a lot of the uh, Ospreys, which I collect up here. And uh, when I was younger, I used to love to read War Game books and just study the mechanics. I was fascinated with the different mechanics that all of the authors would employ in the rules because I always liked the books that had a set of rules in them and my favorite author and my favorite book of all was this one by Donald Featherstone I never owned it but I would go to the library and just sit there and read it just repeatedly and I'd check it out and then a lot of times they'd say well you got to turn it back in you can't check it out again and so I would just go to the library and just read it. Featherstone's Complete War Gaming. I just, this, this is just my favorite. But, you know, Donald Featherstone in general was a favorite author of mine. But I couldn't really get a lot of his books in the States. So I only became aware of them if I had a library that had something of his. But, yeah, my goal this year is to actually start reading these. I said to read 10 of them because I figured that's doable. But I really would like to read more than that from front to back. One of the things I think that is lacking in our hobby these days is a sense of um, is a sense of um, history, history for the hobby and where we've come from and what we've built our hobby on. You know, when I was growing up, you know. <sighs> A person wouldn't dare to say they were going to write their own wargaming rules or war game period if they had not went and read and researched these books. I mean, that was just a prerequisite, right? Everything was based on something else. It was an improvement. It was the next evolution. And we don't see that a lot in our hobby no more, right? That's kind of gone. Instead, you know, what we have seen is this kind of this new Kickstarter model where... People come up with some wacky ideal and they throw a bunch of art behind it and they throw a bunch of miniatures on top of the art and then they sell it to people. And this is why a lot of people buy these board games slash quote miniature war games and then they're disappointed and say, well, the game was not good. I mean, I remember when Mythic did Reichbusters. 
You know, everybody was crazy about that game. And I remember watching a reviewer say it was unplayable. He literally said, he said, I cannot rate it on playability because it's unplayable. Right, and this was a guy on the dice tower. So I mean, this wasn't like some just random guy sitting in his room. That's all they do on the dice tower. And he said it was unplayable. Right? I I was just watching a content creator I watched today who took a poll on his channel and said, "Well, what's your most disappointing dungeon crawlers?" And there were people saying Gloomhaven. Uh there was one they they said uh Alter Quest. Uh and some other big, big Kickstarters that brought in millions of dollars. But these people said when they got the game, it was to a large degree unplayable. It did not make sense, right? They couldn't figure it out or it didn't work the way it was supposed to, right? A lot of them commonly said, well, you just do the same thing over and over again. It's just the same thing. And so I'd say a reason because of that is people do not go back to primary sources no more, right? They do not go back to the history of gaming and playing with miniatures and rules and all of this type of stuff. So even if you're not into the old school pure war games like this, you know, if you're going to write a quote, fantasy or role-playing game, you should at least go and read these rules. You know, read the Lord of the Rings rules. Read some of these rules. And look at what people have done before. And so I, you know, I do not want to fall into that, right? And I, I, I'm just as acceptable as anybody where you will get to the point where all of a sudden you know, it, it doesn't really, you don't really need to read anything else and learn or absorb anything else. Just just come up with an idea and just hack it out. And so I want to go back this year to my roots. I want to really just saturate my mind, saturate my thinking with uh, the old guys' concepts, the old guys' understandings. And many of these 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 guys that wrote these rules back in the day, they were they were as much of historians and research scholars as they were gamers, right? A guy like Don Featherstone was a veteran of World War II, but he was also a scholar of, of, of the war. He wrote literally real books, nonfiction books on things like the English Longbow. So they drew on all of that. Some of these early... Uh, Writers, I think there was one named uh, Peters who was actually a real general in the military, right? Uh, so Dunnigan, a guy named Dun Jim Dunnigan wrote uh, some rules, and he was actually he actually designed real military war games. So I just think it's important that at some point you have to resaturate your mind with these thinkers, with their understandings and their concepts so that, you know, if you want to create something on your own or even if you want to take a system and make it better, right, go back and read and understand what the what the people before you did. I mean, if you're into to box war games, you know, you should play and you should know about all these war games and all their mechanics, right? And I'm telling you, a lot of the games we see today are nothing more than box war games, right? But a lot of it speaks to the type of people that have come into the hobby now who are totally unaware of the history of the hobby. All they're aware of is, well, this was the first game I played that wasn't Monopoly, and it was so fun, and they want every game to be like that, right? The first game they played that wasn't Monopoly. Right, And if it's not like that, they don't like it, they give it a bad review, or they don't know anything about it. And so I, I just have decided this year I am going to reacquaint myself with what they call the classics in, uh, in regular literature. Alright, so that brings us to number 8. This is a, a miniature war game I created. I don't know when. I, I, I want to say probably in 2000 and... 15 or somewhere around there called a fatal blow 
So this this game is uh, actually this is my favorite miniature skirmish game, which obviously it should be since I wrote it. But uh, I want to do a revised edition of this game. Uh, I want to kind of update the pictures, update the layout. I always wanted to add a campaign section onto the bottom back of this, uh, and then I wanted to expand some of the character classes and things like that but uh, I've actually done some videos on the channel of a playthrough of this which I will I will try to link to that but you know if you haven't noticed already a lot of my goals and resolutions build on each other so just prior to saying this one I indicated I wanted to go back and start reading more of these war game rules at least 10 of them and kind of refamiliarize myself with a lot of the concepts and things in there. And that in turn, I hope will help me to revise this. Uh, one of the things I want to do is, is make it, put it more in a format to what most people look for when they buy uh, miniature war game rooms. I mean, something like, like an Osprey book. I mean, right now this is kind of what it is. So if we look at, let's just take out Reamer. So, I mean, if you were to put them side by side, other than the color of the book, and then, of course, they have pictures of miniatures and things like that, whereas I have, well, I do have some pictures of miniatures. But one of my goals is to kind of take it out of this kind of this Osprey format, which is what this one is more modeled after, and maybe bring it more into a... Uh, you know, something like this, the old Reaper Warlord. So you got the book, you got the pages, you know, and you have more of a traditional layout with art. Now, of course, Reaper has access to a lot of fantastic art, which I do not. Uh, so they could put out a book like this back in the day. But either way... You know, I really would like to update the, the book. I think it's time to do a new edition. And along those lines, that is my my number eight goal is to start working on that new edition. Uh, you know, maybe even start purchasing some art for it. And all of that's assuming, of course, I'm, I'm back to work and I, I've got a budget that I can spend on that. But... Uh, yeah, that is a goal of mine. Okay, so my next resolution, which I think is number nine, uh, is related to what you see here. Now, what you are actually looking at, if we pull out a little, is a is a large kind of display shelf. And this is actually in my, my living room or my main room or dining room, whatever you call it. It's the only room other than the bedrooms in my apartment. Uh, so I only really keep my models out here. You know, that way if you have guests or people come over, uh, you know, most people know what military models are. So they're not going to look at you weird to see a bunch of little miniatures out. But even more so than that, you know, I don't have to worry about anybody pocketing a couple or knocking them off of shelves. But my goal this year is actually to uh, come up with a dedicated shelf for my miniature figure so you can see I have kind of this dedicated shelf for my armor collection all of the models that I've built so now I would like to kind of take that concept and uh, create a dedicated kind of I think they're called debt loft shelves I know Ikea sells them with kind of the glass door or the glass enclosure where I could literally just show some of my better painted miniatures that have been in cases now for you know unfortunately years uh but i'd like to just get them out and have them on the shelf so i'm thinking of maybe putting the shelf right here in this space where this wall is at and you know it would be out in uh in my living area but the shelf would have a lock right so it wouldn't be open like this you could lock it and close it and again that's something i could do relatively quickly uh, you know, assuming I get the funds and then all I have to do is pick the miniatures. But I really would like to do that also because, again, I said all of my goals are building on each other. 
So if I have a shelf here with miniatures, it's going to be a lot easier to grab them or select them and say, hey, I'm going to use these this weekend in a game or in a campaign. Again, with the dedicated game table. So you play them, you put them back in the shelf. Uh, when you're ready to play them again, you take them out. And then maybe every few months you rotate the miniatures in your shelf. So that is actually one of my goals this year is to have a dedicated shelf of miniatures. All right, so this has to do with the number 10 resolution that I have for 2023. And that resolution is to create uh, a series of army lists. Now, this is actually one of the few army lists that I have ever created. Uh, and this was for a German reinforced platoon, which I think I used this platoon in a... Uh, a game, a video battle report I did of boat action. It was like a three-hour battle report with the Germans versus the Airborne. And if we look here, it should we should find the Airborne platoon here. Preparatory bombardment, NCO with machine gun. Now, I do know, I think I had did more than one. Oh, no, here it is, paratrooper squad. So this was the list. This was my Airborne squad that was used in that game. And I really, actually, I really enjoyed putting that together. But for some reason, I have never gotten around to doing new list. And so my goal this year is to do a series of army lists. Because what I've come to realize, if you have an army list prepared, even if you spend the time preparing it, you are much more likely to actually play a game. Uh, and so I want to build an army list for A Song of Ice and Fire because I have a couple of factions in that game. I want to build an army list for my Dead Zone, which I had built at one time. I don't know if I still had that one. I want to do another boat action army list for the Marines and then the Japanese. I want to do a Star Wars Legion army list. I want to do a kill team list for my Def Corps Krieg and my Orc so I can do some battles with them. I want to do a army list for Osprey's Broken Legions, Osprey's Outrimer, Osprey's Ghost Archipelago. I want to do an army list for the Chicago Way game I showed you. And I want to do an army list for Legends of the West, the uh, Warhammer historical game, which I picked up this year. Which, by the way, was one of my, my grail items. I don't think I mentioned it last time, but I have been trying to get another copy of that. And I did get it this year. And I got it for less than 100 bucks, to be honest with you. Which, you know, you just got to look. I think I got it for $60. But, uh, yeah, this 2023, I really would like to do a lot of army lists. Now, I don't know if I'm going to do a special binder or folder for them. And then maybe hang it from my table so that I can just, you know, file through it or whether I'm going to keep them in their respective boxes. But uh, I really, I just, I just want to do that. I mean, it's something I've never dedicated a lot of time to because I'm not a competitive gamer. But I think there's some utility in just having and even just doing the list, even if you never take it and use it competitively. And so we come to number 11 which I didn't even know I had done 11, but number 11 is to read more fiction. And one of the series that I really like that I want to get through is this series here called Mallory's Knights of Albion. And it's basically kind of a, a, uh, a, a pseudo uh, resuscitation of uh, the, the the myths of the Knights of King Arthur. And basically, it's based on a premise that manuscripts previously undiscovered written by Sir Thomas Mallory uh, contains more stories of other knights of King Arthur that were never mentioned in uh, Mallory's Le Mort de Arthur. And so one of them is this guy here. This He's called the Savage Knight, and his name was Sir Dondino. And I read this a few years back. This was an excellent story. Uh, it's basically about a knight who uh, goes after a werewolf and winds up in a community where they're basically protecting slash worshiping this werewolf. 
and children and villages have been disappearing. So he is sent to uh, deal with and dispatch that werewolf. But the kicker to the story is Sir Domdeno is also a berserker. So he goes into a berserk rage at times in battle and uh, basically, you know, takes on this superhuman aspect. And so you have some other knights here. This one is called the Black Chalice, the Dark North, uh, based on kind of that same series of uncovered documents. And so, you know, as I was saying about uh, being able to refamiliarize yourself with the classics when it comes to miniature wargaming, I also believe the same thing is necessary when it comes to fiction in general. And, you know, there is there comes a time when there is a need to rediscover good fiction, right? To read good fiction and breathe it in and uh, let it saturate you. And, man, this is what will give you the ideals to play, right? This is what will inspire you to set up that game table, to paint those miniatures, and to run through that scenario, right? Is if you finish a good book, if you finish a good story. And I have always loved the stories of Arthur. I have always loved uh, the stories of uh, the Lord of the Rings. This is kind of a pseudo Lord of the Rings written by a guy named Dennis McKiernan. And these books stand on their own just as much as the Lord of the Rings. They don't have the lore and the history of the Lord of the Rings, obviously. But they do have the feel and the spirit and the essence. And this is these are called the uh this is called Book Three of the Iron Tower Trilogy. That's an excellent series if you like J.R.R. Tolkien. So that is one of the things I want to do this year is kind of refamiliarize myself with uh just the fiction and the inspiration that you can get from fiction. And then allow that to, you know, inspire, you know, a lot of my gaming. All right, guys. So we are back where we started. And that is my top 10 plus 1 uh, 2023 New Year's resolution. So I'm definitely interested in your thoughts and um, kind of what some of your top 2 or 3 resolutions are going into the year. I will say one last thing. Uh about my 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 take on resolutions especially hobby resolutions in general and that is i think your hobby resolutions should complement you know your your personal life uh and you should kind of incorporate the resolutions into kind of what you see on the horizon for yourself so for example if you are relocating and you're moving across town or you're scaling down you know maybe you're moving into your own place you know maybe you want to eliminate a lot of stuff and kind of condense your collection on the other hand if you're buying a new place and you've got your own game room your own basement you know maybe this is the year you build that that man cave uh, on another hand if you want to get out and be more social if you're tired of being locked up and you know cooped up in your home you know maybe you will Go sign up for some games, you know, at your hobby store. Maybe you will go to some more conventions. Maybe you will join a gaming club. Uh, things that are going to get you out. On the other hand, if, you know, you're out a lot and you're not home and you want to be in your house more, you want to kind of enjoy your home more, you want to stay closer to home, you know, maybe this is the year that you spend more time, uh, in your hobby doing things like organizing your collection cataloging your games uh, painting more of your miniatures and things like that just because you you want to do things that are going to keep you home and so when you do that that's kind of your first step because if you know your your life is going to take on a different character in the coming year your hobby is going to have to take it on too so you might as well incorporate that the other thing is if you know you are you are uh doing your hobby goals or you're trying to do uh new year's resolutions then 
you know, you should obviously want to do things that you think are going to be achievable or things that are, uh, you know, are, are not going to cause any kind of uh, confusion. So, for example, you don't want to pick a hobby goal that's going to require you to spend a lot of money, like if you're unemployed. You know, for example, in my situation, so if you notice most of my hobby goals, none of them had anything to do with with making any more purchases. None of my hobby goals had anything to do with spending more money in any kind of way like that. Uh, all of them kind of had to do with making use of, even getting rid of uh, a lot of the things that I, that I have right now uh, in the hobby. And so, I mean, that's just kind of a piece of advice I would give you. I know a lot of people don't like doing resolutions at all. You know, and that's cool, but, you know, there is a saying, they say those who plan to fail, I mean, who fail to plan, plan to fail. So, you know, there there's some truth in that. I mean, if you have no goals or no resolutions, then you're pretty much going to do the same thing this year you did last year. And if you're cool with that, then, you know, hey, that, that's no that's no biggie. But if you would like to see your hobby look differently at the end of this year and be able to look back and say, yeah, I made a lot of changes this year and uh, I really I really enjoyed my hobby more uh, as a result of those changes, then that's that's when I think doing some kind of uh, preliminary resolutions and things like that can help. I mean, some of these obviously, you know, I may or may not hit. There's a lot of reading involved this year. So I'm not sure if I'm going to do that. It's going to require, you know, really focusing on reading and cutting off the TV and the YouTubes and stuff. There's other things I'm going to do that I didn't even consider a uh, a resolution because it's just things I'm going to try to keep doing. Like I, I want to keep making videos and putting out content. So, uh, you know, if I if, if I am playing more games, I am going to try to record them. Uh, I want to finish up a lot of unfinished projects, you know, and I will probably be doing a video discussing that, you know, because I've, I've kind of made a list of a lot of my unfinished projects that I would like to see finished in 2023. I know um, one of the newer things going around now is this finish in February. We're kind of the whole month of February. A lot of hobby people and gamers dedicate that to finishing projects that they started uh the prior year or years prior to that now the final thing i will say and like i i mentioned this once but again i know some of you might have missed this with with my resolutions i think it's very important to build resolutions that build on each other that support each other so for example you know i had a resolution to turn this into a dedicated gaming space but I also was talking about the resolution to get all of these miniatures a place where I can put them on display so I can just grab a, 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 a bunch of miniatures and just sit them on top of the table that is already set up. I had a resolution about reading more reference books and reading more uh, of the classic uh, wargaming literature, which will hopefully inform me as I try to do a revised edition of my game rules so you kind of want to create resolutions that build on each other if i am creating game lists it's going to make it easier for me to play games which is my first resolution right which was to play more play more war games so and then of course using my painting and my airbrush will also allow me to get things to the table painting board games will make me want to play the board games after i paint them. that's the ideal Right, but that's the ideal. But you have a much greater chance of finishing any given resolution if all of your resolutions tie in and support each other. So even though you may have 10 items on one resolution, you might not hit them all 10, but you may finish up paint you may finish painting four board games that year. Right? But then the other one you may you may actually get a game in a week. So I hope you got I hope this guy's helped you. I hope it was a little bit interesting. Uh, stay tuned. Like I said, I'm going to try to get some other videos out. There was a few I wanted to do before the end of the year, but I will just kind of do them at the beginning of this year. There was a few like top 10 lists and things like that, a few other ones. Uh, but the year ended so quick, it seems like it was, it was drawing to an end and then it was over with. And so we are now in 2023. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. Don't forget 
Uh, a lot of these are going up for sale. So if you're looking to pick up any extra painted miniatures, you know, maybe you have a resolution that this year you're only going to buy painted miniatures. You're not going to buy unpainted stuff. Then, you know, check out my eBay store. All right. Take care and God bless.